Okay, Grant, now we have more than 30 people. So I will um, already be the spoiler now and um, lift the, the quiz. So actually the correct answer is 1856. Um, this is the year, or at least the, the last year, when um, the Rothamsted trials in um, Great Britain were established, or the longest running ones were established. That's an institute in, in England where they have been comparing not only conventional and organic, or not conventional and organic agriculture, but simply different agricultural management practices. Um, quite interestingly, that is also the place where, for those of you who are interested in statistics, that's also the place where the uh, where uh, Reynold Fisher was active, who has been developing the ANOVA and T tests. So that is also going back to England, Rothamsted, and um, so now nearly 170 years of agricultural research there. Then in 1978, that's when the feeble long-term trial, which I will um, show you just now, was established. In 1981, the um, long-term trial comparing organic and conventional agriculture was established in uh, the United States of America at the Rodale Institute. That is also quite an impressive long-term trial where they have um, been um, producing great results in terms of soil fertility and soil structure, how those things change over the years under conventional and organic management. And I'm quite happy that 17 people voted for 2007 because that's the year when um, we have been establishing our long-term trial in India, um, which I will also introduce to you later on. So thanks a lot. Now 34 people have been participating. I will now go back to the presentation and tell you a bit more about our long-term trial in Switzerland. So our long-term trial in Switzerland, it's called DOC, uh, again, a German abbreviation. It was established in 1978 and focuses on the system comparison um, on broadly organic against conventional, having four different treatments uh, of biodynamic, bioorganic, then integrated production, so conventional with farmyard manure, for example, and then um, simply conventional production with um, mineral fertilizer. So there we have um, those those um, broad management regimes and different um, different levels of um, of uh, applied fertilization additionally. And then we have altogether those 96 plots. Um, and here you can see the broad outline of our area, which is actually quite close to to where our institute is. But now coming to one other big resource that FIBEL is, um, is producing actually every year, which I think is, is really great if you want to learn more about how um, organic agriculture develops globally. That is a free report. It's quite, quite lengthy. So it has of around 300 pages, I think, where you can actually look up every country where there is data available which kind of crops are produced, what are the challenges that are faced in each country, and um, how uh, the market and the production evolved over the years. As well, we have some chapters on like standard, um, standard development and participatory guarantee system, policy supports, and um, yeah, as said before, the, the market development. You can simply download it at as, um, our website and um, keep an eye open for the new report. So now I would quickly present to you some, um, some main results of our report, which can be relevant for us today. Um, again, we have a quiz question. Uh, when 
Um, when we proceed in the presentation, there will be less quiz, so don't worry. Um, so, but now the question is how much of the agricultural land globally is managed according to organic practices? For that, we go again, you can simply stay in that browser where you have been before, or you go again to menti.com, use the code there, and then decide whether maybe you know even how many hectares are managed organic. Um, maybe you just guess, but um, yeah. So it could be 10 million hectares, 30 million hectares, 45 million hectares, 60 or 100. Great, eight people already there. We will wait again for roughly one minute. Okay, thanks a lot. Again, 30 participants, we will lift the, the quiz. So while 100 million hectares would be a great goal, we are currently at roughly 60 million hectares that are managed globally according to organic practices. Uh, we can see in the this slide here how it has been developing over the last couple of even decades. Uh, so in 1999, we started with roughly 10 million hectares and we have seen quite a steady increase and now um, some 16, 17 years later, we have uh, the six fold. So we are in um, 60 million hectares almost um, that are managed according to organic practices around the globe. So um, how is that, that um, area managed? Interestingly for me is quite the largest share of it is managed um, as permanent grassland. Then we have 7% uh, of permanent crops and 19% of arable land crops. So this large share of permanent grassland is coming from um, Oceania, or more specifically Australia and New Zealand, where there's a lot of um, sheep cattle production um, that is managed on, on grassland. So that is explaining of, of course, also there, the land holdings are quite immense. So that is where the, the huge contribution of permanent grassland is coming from. And then permanent crops, of course, we have a lot of those um, high value crops such as um, cacao or coffee. And then the other ones, uh, and also a couple of ones where we don't have details. But again, those kind of things you can always download in our report. Coming more to regional focus, um, looking specifically at Asia, how the, um, the share of agricultural land has developed over the last years. Uh, we have the, seen this quite steep increase so that we are now uh, of roughly 6.5 million hectares that are managed in Asia according to organic practices. The leading share of that um, of that area is in China with 3 million hectares, but then closely followed by India, where almost 2 million hectares are managed according to organic practices. So we have those two very strong leaders and then some smaller countries following up. But when we look now at organic producers, we have 2.8 million producers that are certified organic, and they're actually 
India is world leading with more than one, one million producers um, that are certified organic. Also from this high share of uh, producers coming from India, we can also see that here this global distribution is largely thanks to India so that we can see in terms of continents that Asia is leading with 47% of global organic producers. Again, here we also kind of see that very, very steep increase. Um, and yeah, that's, that's very impressive and also um, great to see how, how relevant organic is for how many people, especially in India. So now we come to our projects that are focusing on organic cotton and our last but not least no not not last but almost last quiz question so um, whether you know which country is the biggest producer of organic cotton so we go again to menti.com we have another minute the producers the choices could either be india china united states turkey or kyrgyzstan Great, thanks a lot. So most of you are right. The biggest producer is India. Interestingly, also um, one third of the people here voted either for United States or China. But let's look at the numbers. So we see India as the biggest producer globally, contributing to more than 50% of the global organic cotton production. Then second up is China with 17%, and then third is Kyrgyzstan. So Turkey and United States only follow like, I think so Turkey is seventh and then United States might be fifth. Um, so quite different than one might assume, but I'm happy that most of you have already voted for India there. So organic farmers that are involved in India in organic cotton production is 166,000 farmers on roughly 300,000 hectares. So the average organic cotton producer um, is managing less than two hectares if we go with those numbers. Then also going into um, India-wide statistics that of all the cotton that is produced in India, only a little more than 2% is organic cotton. But looking at the states that are the biggest producers in organic cotton, of course, we have Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat. But then for organic cotton, actually the most important producer at the moment is Odisha. So coming to Feeble's engagement in organic cotton, um, we have been working um, in India in organic cotton since 2007 when our long-term trial was established. Since then, we have been quite active in, especially in cultivar evaluation, seeds and um, soil improvements, and then the, the projects that are related to um, the one that I'm going to present to you later on, the seeding, the green future. So green cotton, which is also working towards cotton breeding and genetic, genetic diversity. Um, we continuously also have some, um, some 
uh, activities and workshops where some of you might have uh, been attending previously. We're always happy for you to join. And now I would like to present to you some um, more insights from the um, Syscom trial in India. So here you see the site, which is near Kastabat, um, at the campus of Bayre, our uh, strong partners for our long-term trial. You see here, that's the, the office buildings, and there are the um, some of the plots that we are managing. We have a comparison, as said before, between organic and conventional farming systems. I will quickly show you the details. But um, so here in the upper row, we have two strips. Um, the upper row here is now cotton and then the, the row below is um, soybean. And then we also have some smaller plots at the very top, um, which are part of our participatory research, which I will also present to you quickly. But our long-term trial in India is not a standalone trial. It is integrated into a bigger project or a bigger program of uh, long-term comparisons. Our two other um, countries where we are active in a long-term trial are Kenya and Bolivia. Each of the three countries has a different focus crop. So in Kenya, it is um, a maize-based system, but it has including um, it's including very different um, very different um, vegetables, and is comparing organic versus conventional um, management practices, but at different levels of fertility. So a high and low input system. So also the high input system has um, more additional. Um, external inputs involved in the low input system. So there's one organic low, one organic high, one conventional low and one conventional high. Then in Bolivia, we ha have, um, we are working on uh, perennial crops. So the main um, crop is cacao and we are managing those in either a monoculture or an agroforestry system. In the agroforestry system, we have um, plantains, coffee, and timber trees integrated. So it's quite a diverse agroforestry system. And again, here, one monoculture, one agroforestry is managed either organic or conventional. And then in India, as I said before, our main crop there is cotton. It is um, a two year rotation and it includes wheat and soybean and our different comparison um, treatments are organic and biodynamic as two organic treatments comparing conventional treatment with and without um, genetically modified uh, organisms as seeds. So here you see our crop rotation. So in conventional and con BT conventional, we have cotton followed by wheat, soybean, and then again, wheat. Um, in organic systems, we have introduced that second wheat following after cotton, only after a couple of years, because that is one of the suggestions that were made by the farmers, that it is um, that it has been becoming a more common practice to have a second wheat after cotton. Um, but we are also trying to follow a best practice approach so that on one side in the long term trial you face the difficulty that you need to have comparable treatments so you also have to keep them for a longer time similar otherwise if you change them every year and then it can it's quite difficult to to um, deduce any long term effects but we have been now substituting wheat with chickpeas. And from our first results, it is also performing way better than it was um, the second wheat. So now we have here in the organic and biodynamic treatments, we have cotton, chickpea, and soybean, and then wheat. From our results that we have seen over the last 12 years now, so that is a very simplified version, of course. Um, 
of the results and I would highly recommend um, some of the publications. A new one is just coming out on productivity and profitability, but this is a bit of a spoiler here. So we in soybean, we see quite similar yields um, as a leguminous crop that pre performs very well in organic systems. Whereas uh, when we look at seed cotton yield there, um, the conventional and BT conventional are performing better than the organic and biodynamic treatments. Overall, what we see as challenging for the organic production is the nutrient availability at key stages of the crop development and of course, pests and disease damages. As I have mentioned before, we also, apart from this long-term experiment um, on station, we also have quite an active part where we have participatory on-farm research with farmers, um, which we say with, with the farmer, for the farmer and by the farmer, which might be contradictory to some more established um, concepts of uh, agricultural research, but we see that um, they, that farmers who are in the field every day they they know they know oh, very very much about um, what is what would be needed for improving the um, the production and also have uh, vast resources when it comes to experience of what is working and what is not working. So especially in organic agriculture, um, also in Europe, we have seen a lot of the big innovations in organic agriculture actually coming from farmers, um, coming from their experience on the field, their ability to improve and um, iterate their own practices. And of course, uh, strengthening that with scientific approaches has been yielding great results for us. Um, and one of the, so we are also our partners in, um, at the, the long-term trial site, um, Bioray, they are actively uh, working with other uh, with other farmers in the Nima Valley. And one very interesting result for us was there to see um, that when it comes to productivity of a cotton um, cotton farm, comparing conventional against organic practices. Here we see on the uh, the y-axis the kilogram per hectare. And then the different points are assessed by um, for the different farmers. And we do see that while the average in conventional might be slightly higher than organic average, um, that the actual farm performance can often be way more decisive on the ground than the overall management practices. So that is also why we see capacity building as a key element to further develop organic farming and strengthen the production and the sector. So um, to give you a bit of the idea how we work with the farmer. We have this scheme of how our participatory on-farm research works. So we have the, the some demo trials where we test solutions, which um, are coming from focus group discussions with the farmers, where we prioritize problems and identify potential solutions. And then farmers can select those solutions and test those solutions in on-farm trials, which we here call baby trials. And then farmers, we meet with farmers, farmer staff meets uh, from Bayeri with the farmers to exchange experiences. And um, we are working to modify the solutions that we have been previously um, um, supporting. And so we, we are going into this iterative uh, process of um, the solutions which we are trying to provide for the farmer, which in the end should, of course, improve their livelihoods. And we also see that, that involving the farmer in the research also strengthens a lot the, the ownership. So when farmers are able to, to report back, we not only profit from that in terms of um, that we we have a vast resource of experiences there, but also that farmers are more actively engaged in finding the best solutions in their 
for their own field and for their own farm. So one of the publications that has come out of this participatory on-farm research is um, focusing on making phosphate available for uh, organic and smallholder farmers. So now I would like to um, come from the long-term trial to our um, engagement in breeding and seed availability of organic cotton. Um, but as breeding is quite a lengthy process, one could ask why we need to invest on organic cotton breeding in India. Um, originally, we have those four species of um, cotton cultivated in India. Um, the Hirasutum, the upland uh, cotton, which is tetraploid etna, the Barbadense, the Egyptian cotton, also tetraploid, and then the Aboreum, the daisy cotton, and the uh, Herbacium, also daisy and also deployed cotton. But um, there has been very little genetic improvements of non-GEM seeds after the introduction of BT cotton. And um, in our assessment, we see a, like a missing public breeding programs for organic and low input conditions um, and nationwide cultivar testing under organic conditions. Um, that is accelerating the loss of genetic diversity. The more resilient traditional daisy cotton, um, arborium, has uh, almost disappeared from production. So as you all know, gen um, GM, since the introduction, they have um, had a huge influence on the um, organic seed market and also on the non-genetically modified seed market. So while we now have learned that India is leading on the global organic cotton production, um, it only accounts for those 2% of the, of the overall Indian cotton production, while um, GM cotton is now more than 95%. When we look at the historic development of how, um, how many of the um, different cotton species were grown, going back to those four species, we can see that in 1947, um, the, mainly the Indian native species have dominated. Then we have seen like a fast forward in 1995, a strong growth of hybrid and, um, and varieties of Hirsutum. And then um, with the introduction of, right before the introduction of um, genetically modified, we see that a herosotum already dominates the organic cotton market and now has um, taken over basically what is available in terms of seeds in India for, for cotton. One could see that as kind of a vicious circle when genetically modified cotton dominates, um, we see little investment in other non-GM seeds, which then on the other hand leads to low performance of non-GM seeds. While there might have an initial advantage or disadvantage when no investments are taken to strengthen the varieties that are already there, they perform lower compared to others which are further developed. And then again, in turn, we have a low or a small non-GM seed market, which then also it leads to lower investment. Um, the impacts of those genetically modified dominance is that organic farmers and farms struggle to find quality organic seed. We have um, a high dependency on global seed company holding the BT license. We see um, an increased risk throughout the value chain um, because of the increased risk of genetically modified uh, contamination and um, quite, of course, a small market to invest in. Then we have the more traditional um, and more resilient daisy cotton crops are disappearing, which increases the yield gap. So in our opinion, this needs collective action to break this cycle. 
um, meaning increasing investment in non-GM cotton build in breeding, improving non-GM cotton performance and availability, capacity building among sector st stakeholders, and ensure integrity throughout the seed supply chain. But why, again, why should fashion care, also coming back a bit to the title of our conference here, um, we see that the seed quality and seed availability is important for stakeholders in different ways on the level of markets, producers, and for the organic standards. So for markets, of course, they are important to take into account when um, having breeding um, programs because uh, when breeding for organic cotton, we need to uh, take into account the market requirements of fiber quality in terms of fiber fineness or staple length. Then on the level of producers, of course, it's, um, it's crucial to have um, optimized um, organic seeds to increase the yields and increase the tolerance to environmental pressure as well as pest and disease resistance. Um, a very, very important point is on the organic standards. As you know, that organic cotton has a limit of um, allowed contamination for GM, um, uh, for GM cotton. So if there is little seed availability of approved um, organic cotton seeds, this risk of contamination is significantly improved, um, increased. So organic cotton breeding, here we focus on these um, cotton qualities. Coming to the objectives of the Seeding the Green Future program, we want to secure the quality organic seed supply chain for organic cotton farmers, to develop a portfolio of new organic cotton cultivars with improved agronomic performance, higher fiber quality, and it should be adapted to various local organic growing conditions, having also a high resilience towards climate change and by involving the farmer, also um, ensuring a high adoption rate of farmers. And again, here um, it's important to, to emphasize the integrity of the organic so cotton supply chain at the source by capacity building and close collaboration of actors all along the supply chain. So we are working with farmers on the ground up to industry levels who are selling organic cotton in jeans or, or other clothes with the overall goal to contribute to improving farmers' livelihoods. When we select for, uh, for a cotton breeding, we have different strategies in mind for organic cotton farmers. So one would be this intensive organic, whereas the other one would be low input and low risk. So high, and high input and intensive organic can produce high yields, but also have quite high um, or relatively high production cost. And so the risk of crop, um, in case of crop loss, is, is bigger. Whereas for um, resource poor farmers, they might rather choose the, the, the low input, low risk strategies where you can overall gain maybe lower yields, but at the same time also have lower production costs, but so that the overall income is still good. Um, but for this, these kind of simplified two strategies for organic cotton production, we see also different varieties which might be suitable. Then on one hand, the American um, upland cotton, which has the advantages of high yields and longer staples, but on the other side also needs more water, more manure, and is prone to, um, to pests. It is suitable for the ideal cultivation um, conditions such as deep soils, heavy soils, and good irrigation. Whereas on the other side, um, daisy varieties such as Arboreum and Harbeasium are more suitable for, or are also suitable for shallow soils, sandy soils, or little or no irrigation, which might be conditions that most or 
a lot of the organic cotton farmers are faced with. So they have better drought resistance and are more pest tolerant, but again, on the other side, have smaller yields and mostly shorter staple, so a lower price which can be gained. But again, that is something that we take into account in our breeding project. Um, what is makes us like our breeding project, sorry, different from kind of the conventional way of breeding would be where um, we see in the beginning in the conventional way, like a huge uh, a relatively broad um, genetic diversity, which then um, further narrows, narrows down when it comes to variety release. So kind of a bottleneck. And then when seed propagation, we, we have that same genetic diversity um, multiplied for, for supplying farmers and producers with the propagated seeds. So in this type of conventional, or let's say, um, more um, established way of breeding. We have uh, kind of a one way from the scientist to the extension service to the farmer. And in our breeding approaches, we want to put the farmer at the center. So we, want, we are involving different levels of experts. So it's not only the farmer that is active in breeding, but um, he, he or she is, is supported by by influences from professional breeders, but also from agronomists, social scientists, customers, so involving the supply chain. Now, again, this is now the last time of our, um, our little quiz. I would like to ask you which roles could um, farmers take in participatory breeding approaches? So there is the next slide. I have listed now a couple of roles which could be possible for the farmer. So whether it is defining breeding goals and priorities, selecting or providing sources of germplasm, hosting trials on their land, selecting lines for further crossing, discussing with results with the scientists, planning for the following year's activities, suggesting met methodological approaches, and multiplying and commercializing seeds of the selected lines. So I would like to ask you, which of the, those roles do you see for the farmer in participatory breeding? Again, we have one minute. I hope you're still having your mentee open. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I think our minute is over. We have again almost 30 people who have responded. That's great. Um, most of you have said that the farmer in participatory breeding um, is hosting the trials on their land. Uh, no one has voted for selecting lines for further crossing or suggesting methodological approaches. So uh, now it's coming in. So while Participatory breeding can take many forms. Generally, all of those eight different roles that I have been proposing to you can be taken by the farmer. So the farmer can define breeding goals. They can provide sources of germplasm, of course, host trails on their land. 
selecting lines, all those things that can be um, can be the role of the farmer in participatory breeding, especially the, the for example, the sources of germ germplasm. That is uh, one of the key elements of participatory breeding, where we also see that so that farmers can actually profit from the germplasm that they are providing. Also, of course, in conventional breeding, because we haven't been breeding um, since the beginning of agriculture. So originally, all those sources that we have are coming from the farmer. And participatory breeding is one way of having the farmer profit from, um, from the resources that he or she is providing. Um, of course, we have the, the discussing the results with the scientists. Um, we also have the, the suggestion of methodological changes. Um, one of the interesting things, for, uh, for example, that happened in, in our trial for uh, the, the defining of breeding goals, where we have been evaluating different lines with uh, pharma groups, which we have been separating for women group and man group. And there we have seen different, um, different priorities also for uh, in terms of gender, what people want from their cotton plant. So women have been, um, who are also actively engaged in harvesting, right? They have been often quite um, voting for just easily opening balls, whereas men, um, maybe not that engaged in harvesting, they wanted to see big balls, whereas in uh, the women where we're focusing more on the practical approaches now. So coming back to my presentation, um, I would like to show you kind of a simplified overview of the actors that are involved in our cluster approach um, in terms of the steps that are involved in uh, selecting for one cotton line, we have the crossing, selecting, the testing, the multiplication and the release. release. Um, the crossing can initially be done by seed breeders, well, as then the selection um, is done by farmer organizations. Testing is on farmer field trials and small collaborating farmer organizations. Um, then the, this main cluster of the seed breeder and the farmer organization is responsible for the multiplication and the release of the um, selected lines and also then um, distributes that material to the farmer. So here we also have um, kind of sustained the, um, the sustainability or the continuation of the, the, the project so that pharma organizations own or kind of have the responsibility to distribute and um, share the, the selected lines, but then also by involving the, the different actors and not just one industry level actor, we can be um, we are confident that the breeding can continue and that um, locally adapted um, lines can be optimized for the individual conditions. So here are some impressions from our evaluation of um, different lines with pharma groups. Um, again, here we look and in also into the fiber length, which is um, essential for the for the price that can be gained in the end. We have those women groups, which have been really fruitful for us for in terms of information, what is important. And when we are able to address what is important to the farmer in the selection of lines, we can also make sure that the that the um, that the adaption rate of the farmer is higher than um, when it's just coming this one way of, of knowledge and this one way of, um, of seed supply. Then one other thing that is really interesting uh, to know is that um, from the World Bank, they have released that, that participatory breeding approaches can even be um, faster or are often faster than um, conventional breeding programs, which might take up to 15 years, maybe for the, uh, the release of a variety, whereas participatory approaches can be kind of uh, roughly 10 years or less. 
So this is also reflected in our strategy um, for the um, for our seeding the green future program. Um, the first phase was from 2017 to 2018, building on this the previous projects. We have worked with two clusters, five F, um, pharma organizations, and focusing on um, central India as our region where we work. Then here we are now in the second phase where we work with five clusters and by now 20 pharma organizations and have included also Southern India. And working now with 10 cotton lines. And in the third phase, which is to follow up starting from 2022, we are working with 10 clusters, 40 pharma organizations, and also including Northern India. What is, of course, a key factor for success, um, successful scaling of that project is the, the support from the industry and uh, from foundations there. Here, I want to quickly acknowledge um, the partners that we are working with. So, um, Jetna Organic, Pratiba, Cotton Connect, Asa, just to name a few, and our primary supporters of um, Stiftung Mercata and the Organic Cotton Accelerator, such as the Carrefour Foundation. And here you see a picture of some of the members of um, our project and by a field visit. So uh, what you could also probably access in the future is a manual that we are now developing on participatory on-farm breeding of organic cotton, which will soon be released. For any further information or resources, you can find us online on the website of feeble.org, and there you can also find the, the um, organic world of organic that I have showed you previously. We have um, also um, a newspaper which is published every year, every month, but it's in, available in, in English as well. So the Bio Actuel, um, and then. Here again is the, the world of organic, where you can access the different yearbooks of the different years and see the country info information if you want to have um, graphs or maps for specific regions available. So with this, I would end. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the presentation and thanks a lot. Hello, thank you for your nice presentation. Now the topic is open for discussion. The participants are requested to uh, ask their question in chat box or they can raise their hand. Andrew, are they Andrew, Hello, I am just observing Andrew is in group. So I request Andrew just to uh, share your remarks or you can just ask question. Andrew, sir. I hope Andrew is just listening to me. The director of uh, Organic Agriculture Canada. Anyway, uh, we'll just go to again Irshad Hassan. Irshad la Yershad, you can just ask question. I think Yershad is not actually getting. So, Dr. Sandeep Menon. Uh, sir, my question is... Uh, Ma'am is talking about uh, the breeding of uh, organ, uh, GM uh, uh, cotton. So my question is whether the uh, cultivation of uh, GM crops is uh, allowed in uh, uh, organic agriculture or not? Yeah, can you repeat your question, please? Sir, my question is the use of organic, uh, uh, the use of uh, GM crops is allowed in uh, organic agriculture or not? As per IOF, IFOM. Yeah, you are, please. Thank you. Thanks for that question. 
Um, no, it's not allowed in organic. Mm, I think there might have been some, uh, when we compare different treatments in our long-term trial, there we do use um, BT um, cotton, but only for comparison. So those, those uh, fields that are using a BT cotton or are also managed according to other conventional practices, such as application of mineral fertilizer or um, pesticides that are allowed in conventional, um, those are only there for comparison reasons. We don't count them as organic trials. So in our trial, we have two treatments in conventional and two treatments in organic. And one of the conventional ones is including BT but it is not allowed in organic cotton. Yeah, so Dr. Praveen Kumar Singh. Dr. Uh, Praveen Kumar Singh. Sir, Hello? Yeah, please, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, definitely very informative lectures uh, given by the MIM. Uh, but the question is that uh, in developing country like India, the organic cultivations of cotton is very difficult task because uh, most of the farmers are facing the problem of uh, the heavy infestation of insects and diseases. So how this is possible in developing countries for organic cultivation of uh, uh, cotton? Um, thanks for the question. So I, yeah, I think you are completely right that the pest and disease uh, management is definitely a huge issue that uh, we still need to address in research. Of course, that's one of our key topics there. Still, there are already um, quite a lot of um, well-working examples where people, farmers are able to manage organic cotton in particular, but generally also other organic crops well without heavy levels of infestation. Um, it is um, essential in organic farming to, like as an essential principle, it would be to try to prevent the occurrence of those problems instead of having a um, kind of a reactive approach. So only spraying pesticides once the infestation is already quite high. So um, organic approaches are focusing on strengthening soil health, plant health, uh, and um, also improving uh, the, the availability of, of, for example, natural enemies and using other, um, other natural uh, approaches to avoid high levels of infestation, such as intercrops and a diverse um, crop rotation. Of course, additionally to that, there have been now quite um, a lot of developments where organic um, inputs are also produced at a commercial scale. So while there are originally maybe some hand or house-made inputs that can be used quite successfully for, um, for pest and disease management, such as onions and chili sprays, those kind of things. There are now um, a lot of biological agents, control agents available, um, such as the NPV virus for managing the, um, the American ballworm and cotton. That is just, just one example. But generally, those kind of external input approaches should be followed once uh, the farmer has already um, reached quite a high level of preventive measures in terms of plant health, soil health, and exploring the options of intercropping using, for example, push and pull systems, which is um, quite, quite famously um, successful in, in African countries now for managing pest and diseases. Now I request Dr. Andrew from Canada, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, sir. Very welcome to Dr. Oh, PD. Okay, Kriya. good. Yeah, I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't unmute before, so it was uh, frustrating. Um, thank you, Dr. Goldman or uh, Eva for your presentation. It was very very good. Uh, in Canada, we have some participatory breeding projects as well, um, mostly in cereals but also in vegetables, and it's fairly new. 
Um, what is challenging, however, is again, finding funding to support these kinds of projects and uh, capturing the credibility or the integrity of participatory breeding uh, among you know, government funding agencies. How do you, um, you know, convince funding agencies that participatory breeding is a worthwhile endeavor, that it's worth pursuing? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a difficult one uh, for um, finding the right strategy there. Of course, we have we are quite um, quite privileged there in terms of the choice of our crop because um, there is a high interest from industry side to assure the integrity of the organic cotton supply chain. So that's why we have a big funds from also from industry side from actors that are representative um, represented in this organic cotton accelerator. Um, then what I think is an important strategy for raising funds outside um, of, of those high industry interest crops would be to kind of broaden the focus for just having one improved variety, but also looking at the kind of the context. So in terms of adoption rate of farmers for improved varieties, then looking at, at peasants' right and farmers' rights for uh, multiplying their, their own seeds and contributing to the genetic resources that are used. Um, and then additionally, the big point or big advantage also of those participatory breeding approaches would be to have the locally adapted uh, varieties, which are which are almost impossible to sustain in case you are following a more uh, more traditional or let's say more established way of, of breeding program. Yeah, uh, that's it's and it's very different in different parts of the world as well. Um, I, I also, when I attended the Organic World Congress in Delhi a few years ago, uh, one of the presentations I attended uh, talked about uh, why farmers were uh, leaving organic agriculture or not participating, and one of the biggest reasons was the risk, the financial risk because of yield stability in organic systems. And so they, they because um, farmers were basically just living on the edge all of the time, they couldn't take the risk that uh, they would lose an organic crop. And that's why they were moving to conventional. Do you find that in your research uh, that uh, in terms of uh, and working with farmers that that's a big concern and you know that yield stability or that resiliency is is um, obviously a key factor as opposed to maybe just getting the highest yields but just having a guaranteed yield is perhaps something to strive for. Mm -hmm. Yeah we we have not been looking in depth and uh, in the terms of um yeah, resilient or st stable yields. In the long-term trials, we have not seen any uh, differences in terms of stability for uh, organic and conventional. Um, but of course, that is that's a, definitely an issue for farmers moving out because it, it can sometimes be not financially um, competitive compared to conventional agriculture. And um, especially in countries um, where um, most of the production is um, export orientated. We do face that difficulty that uh, farmers are paid premium prices for here in uh, example for organic cotton, but then other than the farmers in Europe or maybe Canada or United States, they, they are not paid any premium prices for the for the production of the associated crops so let's say organic soybean or organic wheat which are very hard to sell and i think that is definitely a key issue to 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 strengthen organic sector to make it possible that farmers are able to to gain a kind of um yeah let's say compensation for the efforts that are um, that they are taking for organic production outside of this one main crop 
So I think mm -hmm. uh, that is kind of the, the way to go for for organic sector in the future to to broaden the, the premium prices in terms of either having a system premium or finding other ways of compensating for the um, for the ecosystem services provided. Yeah, uh, bang on. Yeah, I, I totally agree that uh, we must be system level planning and having markets for all of the crops in a rotation or a system in order for it to be economically viable. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's lots of other questions, so I will not uh, hold uh, other people back. Are there other questions? So in case later on questions arise, you can still um, contact me um, or have us find us online and um, there look up for the organic cotton sector. There's, there's some things yeah. that you can find. Yeah, you are, you are just one more question from uh, mm -hmm. Abner from Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a second, I'm just allowing him. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I, I'm from Israel, uh, made in India. And uh, <laughs> I, I thought I know everything, but here uh, these two days I'm learning beautiful things. So thank you, uh, um, Goldman Miss and, uh, and the organizers. Uh, one of the things that I uh, uh, noticed uh, in India, from the agronomy side, is that you show the slide that had a uh, desi uh, crop and uh, some other crop, and the root zone was restricted. Now, one of the things that I have experienced in India, in cotton, we don't do deep uh, plowing, you know, para plow or these things. And the, the instant we use paraplow, the root zone is very, uh, uh, oh yes, this one, right, thank you. And uh, the reason that the desi doesn't uh, uh, function well is because of uh, agrotechnics. Uh, because uh, mostly we plow in India with uh, bullocks or something or uh, even with the tractor, the tractor is very shallow plowing. And I would recommend a, for organic and non-organic uh, to use once in a while para plow that goes, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a knife that goes down deep to 60, 80 centimeters. I think then uh, uh, our organic and non-organic uh, crop will be, uh, 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 um, with the real, uh, the production will be high. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you are, this is last question from uh, Mangesh Thakur. Mangesh Thakur, please. Hi, uh, sir. Hello. My question is, uh, which species of cotton more sustainable under organic condition? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that we already see kind of the, the the good slide for that because in our assumption we we see different strategies where there might be some farmers in organic that are producing quite intensively um, and are able to provide um, a high level of resources that we that they are they can be more as adapted to using hirsutum species, but generally. Um, while Arboreum not only has the advantage of, um, of uh, being less demanding in terms of uh, conditions that is needed for a, a good production, um, Arboreum also has the advantage that it is um, that there is a lot less chances of, of crossing out or with um, or less chances of contamination with genetically modified um, cotton. So in generally, um, that is that is a, a very arborium is a very important species or a variety for for organic cotton farmers. 
but of course that de also depends on the individual conditions that a farmer is facing. Those are just kind of general recommendations to take into account when choosing the right variety. So good evening everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Sanjay Kakade, Assistant Professor of Agronomy, Dr. P.D.K. V. Akola. Feel very honored and uh, privileged having an opportunity to give thanks to today's speaker, Ms. Eva Goldman, scientist Tribal, for very nice and informative presentation for the participants of this international training course. Uh, she particularly focus on participatory research approaches on cotton breeding particularly, and that's a very important uh, topic uh, she has covered in today's uh, lecture. I also extend my sincere thanks to course director uh, of this international training course, our honorable vice president, Dr. William Balesar. Uh, because of his inspiration, this uh, training is uh, uh, possible. Also, I'm very thankful to Chief Scientist uh, Center for Organic Agriculture and Training Center, Dr. Ian Paslavar, sir, and his team, uh, Dr. Konde, coordinator of his training, uh, Parishik Singhru, and his, all the uh, team of uh, this court, Dr. Pidiki Vyakola. Uh, I am also grateful to the, all the participants from uh, different states of India and abroad uh, for nice participation and some queries from their side. Uh, uh, in this uh, in this uh, session, so I am also thankful to all the uh, participants who actually participated in this uh, uh, training session, particularly the ARIS uh, staff of this uh, Dr. P D K Vakala for providing the facilities uh, to this uh, uh, training program. So uh, thank you, one and uh, now I request Dr. Konde to have some instruction for tomorrow's session. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Eva, because I have disturbed many times in last two three days. But uh, it just was a for point. Very much for joining, and it was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, friends, uh, today it was a unique day because uh, uh, we call we we can just call it as a woman day because three presentations were delivered by the women, and uh, again uh, the tomorrow morning one more session will be there. Who will? which will be actually delivered by uh, Dr. Paula from Italy. So friends, uh, for tomorrow, uh, you all are requested to join at 13.30, that is uh, 1.30 in PM, 1.30 PM in afternoon, particularly not in the morning itself, because uh, as per the convenience of Dr. Paula, we have uh, just uh, organizing her lecture at uh, uh, 14 hours. So before that, Dr. Yogesh Ingle will be delivering one practical uh, on uh, disease management. So accordingly, followed by Dr. Paula will be delivering her lecture. So the link will be shared uh, in the evening itself. So you can just join by 13.30 tomorrow. So good luck for today and uh, definitely we'll uh, meet uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon. So thanks a lot, everyone. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you.